I, Kweda Joshi, on behalf of entire Skips family, welcome a charismatic personality among us, Mr. Joshua Pollock. <laughs> Mr. Joshua Pollock began his musical studies at the age of four and made his debut with the St. Petersburg Chamber Orchestra of Russia at the age of 12. Joshua Pollock is a student of Kamlesh Deep Patel, widely known as Daji, the fourth guru in the heartfulness tradition. He also worked as an instructor in A.R. Rahman's K.M. Conservatory, as well as on films such as Gajni and Delhi 6. He holds a bachelor's degree in musical arts from Indiana University and two master's degrees from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. An accomplished violinist, Mr. Pollock has performed and taught heartfulness all over the world. As a result of this, he and Mr. Patel put together their experiences of a unique meditative experience, Heartfulness, in a book form titled, The Heartfulness Way. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I have to clarify one point though. I am, I am not the fourth guru of the heartfulness tradition. That distinction belongs to the co-author of The Heartfulness Way, Kamlesh Deep Patel. And I'm a student of his along with so many others, in fact. <clears throat> I've been practicing meditation for the last 15 years, 15, 16 years. And I should say that I think that it's this it is the thing that has helped me more than anything else in anything that I've ever done, not just music. I would say that meditation is something that triggers a state of consciousness in which we can then much better handle ourselves, handle our circumstances. Meditation is not something which is done just because we enjoy meditating. It is something that has to actually last for 24 hours a day. Meditation is a state of being, and this state of being is triggered by the act of meditation, which we do as a discipline, which we do on a daily basis. But to the extent that this state of meditation becomes permanent within us, we actually require less and less of this discipline, this act of meditation because it becomes our very nature over time. So meditation is something which I would suggest that people practice every day, but which also over time is something which need not remain with you, need not become or remain part of your life forever. I can define meditation in a very simple way. Most people, first though, I'll mention that most people I feel have a rather mistaken understanding of what meditation is. Most people, if you ask them, will say that it is a form of intense concentration. And it is, in fact, a state of focus, but I would suggest that it's a state of effortless focus. Effortless focus. Most of the time, when you have to concentrate on something, let's say you're doing your homework, right? you're studying for an exam, is that always an enjoyable experience? No, it's not. You're forcing yourself to concentrate. Do you want to be concentrating on studying at that moment? Perhaps not. Perhaps you'd rather be doing something else, right? So generally we take concentration as something uh, an, where we would rather be thinking about something else, where we would rather be doing something else, but yet we're forcing our mind to concentrate on one topic because we have to, right? But when we're doing something that we enjoy, when we're watching a film or when we're hanging out with our friends, when we're doing something that we enjoy, are we any less focused? No. When you watch a film, you're totally focused on that film. When you do anything that you like doing, or you play a video game, you're totally focused. 
So the only difference is that in those situations in which you're enjoying yourself, you no longer have to make efforts in order to focus. So this is the difference between concentration and meditation. Meditation, you're focused, but it's effortless, it's enjoyable. Concentration, you're also focused, but you have to make efforts to focus because you're not naturally inclined to focus on that particular object, on that particular activity. So this is a distinction that we can make. Effortlessness and effort. Concentration or meditation and concentration. Now, generally, in order to become absorbed in any activity without putting in efforts, something has to be attractive about that. It has to catch hold of your attention and trigger your interest. Then you focus in the most natural way without any effort whatsoever. So how do we achieve this in meditation? People often ask me this question, because I'm a musician, they often ask me whether music and meditation are similar to one another. They say music must be a very meditative activity. So why must you also feel the need to meditate since you're already playing music? And the fact is that they're correct. It is a meditative activity, as is anything else that we tend to do that we enjoy. But this is the thing, the mind, the natural inclination of the mind is to become settled upon any object, upon any experience. As I mentioned earlier, the example of a film, your mind becomes settled and absorbed in that experience. The mind likes to do that. That's when you become happy. That's when you feel content. That is meditation. But then what happens when the experience ends? then you become dissatisfied again and you seek another object upon which to rest your mind. You now are searching for something and you are restless until you find something else, some other experience or activity or idea in which you can become similarly absorbed as you were before. So in this way, the mind is constantly like a pendulum swinging back and forth between a state of contentment and the state of being restless, searching for the next activity or experience in which you can find future contentment. So we go back and forth like this. So yes, even though such activities as playing music or doing anything else are meditative, there is no permanence in those states of meditation. They're all temporary states of being. And they lead to dissatisfaction and restlessness at the end when the activity is finished. What the mind really seeks is permanence. It seeks permanent stability, permanent absorption, permanent rest and contentment. That's when we're happy. That's what we seek. But what in our lives is permanent? Is there anything, any situation, which remains as it is without ever changing? No. So where can we find this? How can we fulfill this deepest desire to remain in a sort of eternal contentment where the mind can rest? So for that, we have to go inside ourselves. We have to find an object that remains with us. So we look within, and when we're able to find something there where we can rest our minds, then we can enter into a state of meditation that remains with us forever and ever and ever. But, but just like anything else, something inside has to attract us. Otherwise, you close your eyes and let's say, there's so many forms of meditation, right? Some people meditate on their breathing, some people meditate upon some chakra, some people meditate on the heart. So when you go inside and you know, 
rest your mind on some inner object, most of the time we find that difficult because there's nothing attracting us there. There's nothing enjoyable about it. We are simply making an effort to concentrate on some part of the body, perhaps. So, how do we overcome this? What is the solution? In our system, we call this heartfulness meditation. And it's because we meditate on the heart. Now there's something very unique about this system of meditation. We call it yogic transmission. There are references to this in some of the ancient shastras, but we don't hear about it so much these days. And in fact, we can describe this in a very simple way. Most of us, in our upbringing, are told by so many people that we should believe in such and such a way of worship. Some people, their parents, grandparents, they say, okay, there's something called God that exists. You should believe in this entity called God. And, you know, everybody has different traditions and different forms of worship, but basically this essential idea is common to all religious and spiritual approaches. But we don't tend to have any experience of this. They can say that God is everywhere and omnipresent and everything like that. And we say, okay, but is that a reality in our lives? Or is it just something, just an idea that we've accepted from our parents? Generally, it's only that just an idea, because we've had no experience of it. In the same way, you can say that even though God is supposed to be everywhere, all around us, like air which surrounds us, air is also omnipresent, but we also tend not to notice the presence of the air that surrounds us. In order for us to notice that, something has to move it. There has to be some kind of uh, a breeze or a ceiling fan like these. And as soon as they start moving, then we all of a sudden feel the current, the movement of air, and then we say, aha, I can sense, I can feel, I can experience the air, right? I would suggest that yogic transmission is the very same thing. When you sit and meditate, along with a trainer, who, uh, that trainer can trigger that flow, that flow of the same divine essence. Whereas before, though it may have been all around us, though it may have been within us, we couldn't feel it, we couldn't experience it, we could only believe in it or disbelieve in it because it was beyond the realm of our own experience. Now all of a sudden for the first time, like the breeze which is triggered by the fan, you sit with a trainer and all of a sudden this energy or this divine essence is moving. It is being targeted at your own heart. And for the first time you can feel it. Now what happens as a result of that? As a result of experiencing that, just like a film when you're in the movie theater, draws your attention, or just like a meal makes you hungry, or the scent of a rose is an enjoyable smell and makes you, your mind focus on that experience. In the very same way, this experience of something subtler, of something higher, of something divine that we've never experienced before, this experience similarly rivets us. This experience grabs hold of our attention and attracts us. And now, as a result, our minds settle down. And because the object that which is attracting our minds is something beyond the mundane. Now this is something that is infinite. 
Now your mind, your awareness, can expand in this infinity forever. And so, as a result, we enter into a permanent state of meditation, which has no end, which does not lead to restlessness and dissatisfaction, but only deepens as time goes on. All we need to do is to refresh this experience on a daily basis through the practice of meditation. And then we find that it is there. That condition is recalled and starts expanding once again. And because this is something that we experience and something that we feel, therefore, we meditate on the heart because the heart is the organ of feeling. It is not as if we can experience such a presence with the knees or elbows or with the liver. It's the heart. The heart's where you feel things. So we meditate on the heart for that reason. And what I would propose to you today is to give you just a taste of this kind of experience. If you are willing, I would like to do this, okay? So let us meditate together, 15 minutes or so, okay? This is something which is not based. It is not something where you have to be a member of any religion to participate in this. My background, I come from a Jewish background. This is, this isn't something that I would call Hinduism that I'm suggesting. I would say that, you know, there are people who are practicing meditation in this exact form from every single religion, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhists, there's there is Catholic nuns who are practicing this form of meditation. So this is something that I think no matter what your religion is, this is something which would only deepen your faith, whatever it happens to be, because this is something which will give you an experience. And from that experience, you now can move on and feel more confident. It's not the other way around. Generally, people say you have to believe first. But on what basis will you believe? This is the opposite of the scientific approach. To believe first, it doesn't make sense. So we say, I mean, also, look what would happen. Look at, suppose you have a friend. What makes you count on your friends? Because they've repeatedly shown that they're dependable. Right? They've repeatedly shown that they're there for you when you need them. Okay, and as a result of that, you say, okay, I know I can depend on this person. It's not the other way around. You don't first say, I have total faith in this stranger that I've never met in my life. Nobody would say that. So it's like that. So this kind of meditation, I feel, will provide you with a certain experience which will enhance your approach to whatever particular tradition that you already belong. So we're not here to say, stop doing what you're doing, not at all. We're here saying, do as you like, but also try meditation. That's our approach, okay? So let me explain to you briefly how we meditate, and then we'll go into it. In this, we meditate on the heart, and specifically, we meditate on the idea that there is light in the heart. Light in the heart. Is this a visualization technique? No. Because this light in the heart has been described in a very peculiar way. Now, pay close attention to this. This is a key point. Okay. So pay close attention to this point. We describe this light in the heart as 
light without luminosity. Does that make sense? In a way, it doesn't make any sense at all. Luminosity, the defining characteristic of light, isn't it? So what does this mean? It means something very simple. Don't get confused. Very simple. It means it's not something that you try to see. It means it's not something that you try to visualize. So what is it? Something that you feel. This light in the heart, when we say we're meditating on light in the heart, it is something that we feel, not something that we try to see, not something that we try to visualize, nothing like that. So we merely close our eyes, suppose that this light, divine light, is present in the heart, and simply wait. Wait to experience whatever it is that you may experience during the meditation session without any expectation, just openness, just receptivity, and nothing else. This is all about feeling. But what do I do with my mind? What do I do with my thoughts? This every person asks. It's okay, the mind it has a purpose. Its business is to think, just as your ears' business is to hear, your eyes' business is to see, the mind's business is to think. Let us not succumb to these popular notions that meditation should make you thoughtless. No. It can happen, but this is not in our hands to make it happen. So. The thoughts come, let them come. They go, let them go. Don't entertain them, don't invite them, but don't repel them, don't fight with them. They are like the background noise, the traffic noise on the street. It doesn't prevent you from leading your life. Let it be there and stick to your business, which is to gently Allow your attention to settle on your heart and see what you feel. That's it. The light in the heart. Some people say, why? Why light? Let's see. This is not a belief, but a hypothesis. Hypothesis is there to be tested. Belief, nobody wants to test a belief. People feel uncomfortable without their beliefs. People don't want to give up their beliefs. Nobody wants to test a belief. But a hypothesis, its purpose is to be tested. And that's what this is. And the way that we test it is through the act of meditation. So meditation is an experiment, plain and simple. Before we meditate, I will walk you through a very simple exercise in which we'll simply relax every part of the body in a systematic way. Having accomplished this and relaxed ourselves, it will be easier for us to meditate. So I will sit here, I'll ask you to Relax your toes, your knees, your arms, everything. And then I'll say, please start meditation. And then we'll meditate, just in the way I've described. After 15 minutes or so, you'll hear me say that's all. And then you can open your eyes. Understood?